Okay, we are on. Hello, everyone. My name is Trinidad Jaciali, and I will be ho uh, your host today. So I would like to welcome you all to the first ABC Candidate Forum. I would like to say it is a real pleasure to be here with you today. And we are pleased to see that so many people are joining us from all over the world, most likely. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please stay with us. We have many um, very um, excellent presentations. We have uh, seven presenters today, and um, we're just going to wait a little bit for you to join us and get comfortable if you need to get some water, if you need to get pen and paper to take some notes. You are very welcome to do so right away. Um, I have to say that um, I am very pleased to be a part of this wonderful event uh, where we're going to hear, uh, hear and learning about many important topics. Um, and we have different people with different areas of expertise that are going to be joining us today. And they're going to be talking about um, some topics that were suggested and requested by uh, you, by ADC candidates. And um, it will be very helpful when you finally get to uh, start practicing in Australia. So um, just a little bit of, the, of this forum, we will be talking about focusing on infection control practices in Australia. We are going to be talking about practicing in metro and rural settings. As you know, this is a huge country and um, yeah, some of the big metropolitan cities are very condensed in small areas, but this is, there's so much more and we need to be ready to um, start practicing in rural practice uh, places as well. We are going to be hearing about providing care to Aboriginal and Tor Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, that's a huge part of the population here in this country, and um, we need to be ready for that as well. We will be having people from APRA to talk about the registration process, and that will be one of the first things you need to know as soon as you pass your exam. Uh, you will be wanna you will want to be ready for this, so get your pen papers again. We will be hearing about the role of the Australian Dental Association in supporting and advocating for the profession that is supporting candidates like you to successfully practice in Australia. And we will get some information about the Dental Practitioner Support Program as well. So let me see. Well, hopefully you're all very comfortable to start today. Maybe I'm not sure if we should wait just one more minute to wait for people to join us. Um, just. Again, my name is Trinidad Casial. I'm going to be hosting this uh, forum today. This is the first ADC candidate forum, so thank you so much for joining us from all over the world. Okay, is everyone ready? So, um, before we start, um, I would like to acknowledge that I am hosting this webinar from the lens of the Gimui, Wulabari, Hidindi, and Yurganji peoples. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are located today and pay my respect to elders past, present and emergence, emerging and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today. So um, to start a little bit about myself, uh, my name is Trinidad Casial, but everyone calls me Trini. Um, and I am a recently successful candidate of the ATC assessment process. Uh, I completed a bachelor of dental um, of dental surgery in 2011, gained experience in both private and public se sectors and specialized in pro prosthodontist in Chile. Then in 2017, I decided to migrate to Australia where I'm currently based with my family in Cairns, I call it paradise. And um, finally, I am practicing as a dentist, very happy here. Um, and I have recently joined the ADC Assessment Committee, and I am the new chair of the Candidate Reference Group. So I am extremely pleased, as I said before, to be representing the ADC and at the same time rep uh, representing all the ADC candidates. I've been through what you've been through not long ago, so it's a pleasure. It's honestly a honor from, uh, for me. So um, I would like to thank you all again. And I would like to thank um, all our presenters for today. I will be introducing um, our presenters that will be um, giving us a little bit of their knowledge just to guide us through this big process. We're going to have Dr. Glenda Farmer, general dentist. 
we're going to have Dr. Martin Hall, Chief Oral Health Advisor in Dental Health Services Australia. We're going to have Kelly Gleason, Oral Health Therapist with Adult Stop. We're going to have Dr. Mark, For sorry, Mark Ford, Acting Executive Officer, Dental APRA. Adjunct Associate Professor Ben Keith, Manager Clinical Input APRA. We're going to have Dr. Scott Davis, Prostodontist. And finally, Annie Williams, Acting Director of Nursing for Statewide Services Turning Point. So those are all the presenters today. Do you want to join me in here? We'll just wait for a little bit until they turn their videos on so you can meet them. There you are. Hello, Glenda. How are you today? Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Hello, um, Dr. Martin Hall. Where is Dr. Martin? Uh, good afternoon. There he Hi. is. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Uh, where is Kelly? Kelly Gleason. Hello. Thank you for having me. Hello, Kelly. Thank you for joining us. Um, Mark Ford. Hi. Thanks very much for having us. Hello, Mark. Thank you for coming. Um, ben Keith, do we have Ben? You do, Trini. Hello and hello to everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, where am I? Dr. Scott Davis, where is Scott? Maybe Scott will be joining us very soon. Sorry about that. And Annie Williams. Sorry, I think Annie forgot to turn her microphone on. Beg your pardon. Sorry, Jenny. Thank you very much for having me and hello to everyone. Thank you all for joining us again. So um, thank you for, uh, for the presenters to be here today with us. Thank you to all the people joining us from all over the world. Uh, we know it's um, late in the afternoon or really late at night, some uh, very early mornings for some of you as well. So thank you for your time and for being with us today. And before we go ahead with anything else, I would like to remind, remind all participants that the webinar will be recorded, so you will have access to it after we finish. Uh, the format of the webinar consists of two sessions, each with three different presentations and a brief panel discussion at the end of this, each session. And participants can submit questions through the Q&A and responses to the most common questions that cannot be addressed in the panel discussion will be, be provided after the webinar. So you have had probably a couple of weeks, even a month, to send you um, some questions regarding the topics that will be um, discussed today. But please, if you do get any new questions during the presentations, you are uh, very free to keep on sending them to us. And as I said before, if there's multiple questions uh, regarding a certain presentation, we will um, just distribute them, the answers as soon as we can. Okay, so um, let's start. Let's move on to session one. So to start with session one, we're gonna start talking about infection control practices in Australia. And for that, we are gonna have um, our first speaker, Dr. Glenda Farmer. Hello, Glenda. Hi, Trina. So to start, I would like to introduce Dr. Dr. Glenda Farmer. is a general dentist who has been involved in infection control in Australia as part of Victorian and Australian Dental Association committees for many years. Glenda has also represented the Australian Dental Association on standards as Australian committees relating to infection control. She also runs a small consulting company helping practices conform with dental practice accreditation documentation, infection control policies and, policies and procedures, and training requirements. Uh, Glenda's Bachelor of Dental Studies was gained through the study of waste habits of a sample of dental practices, and she is here to provide her insights on infection control practices in Australia. So Glenda, the mic is all yours. Thanks, Trina. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. I just have to get back onto my notes view. <laughs> Go on. Um, Veronica, can you stop screen sharing for a little bit? 
I'll have my slide in a second. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks for zooming in today. I wanted to thank the ADC for letting me speak. I do wish, though, this was in person um, because then you could actually see me because, quite frankly, Zoom does not do me justice. In real life, I am sure I do not look this old, but I do need to make a confession. I am so old that when I graduated, we just started wearing gloves and we all hated them. Also, when I started work, you could run a dental practice without an autoclave. Masks weren't common and safety glasses were a new consideration. I have a friend who remembers working in a dental practice that boiled needles to reuse them. But this isn't a history lesson. So Veronica, can we go back to the first slide, please? Thanks, that's fantastic. So what, um, just lost the first slide. Yes, so my aim today is to help you feel more confident about infection control in your ADC exam, but more importantly, I want you to feel more confident about infection control when you get to practice dentistry in Australia. So first, I want to let you know this is not a talk about the science of infection control. There's four things I'm going to talk about today, and they are firstly, confirming that Australia does have an emphasis or focus on infection control practice. And we'll look to Google for a couple of real live examples of that. Secondly, we'll look at who regulates infection control practices. And the third thing we're going to consider is why we have such a focus in Australia, who's in the driver's seat, and finally, what this all means to you. Yes. <laughs> now, because we've only got such a short time, it would be terrible if I missed addressing the big question of what you need to do as an ADC candidate and as a future practicing dentist in Australia. So next slide, please, for the secret. The secret or trick to working out how to apply the scientific principles of infection control it's a bit in that green box that I've added to the competency statement. Glenda's opinion. You need to work out how to apply the scientific principles of infection control in a culturally appropriate way. Remember, don't mix culture with race. Culture is what we instinctively do when no one's watching. And culture changes and evolves. And you can presume it's changed enormously in Australia because now we do all wear gloves and masks and glasses and we all have sterilizers. So by the end of the short time we have today, I'd love you to be able to tell me where you're going to choose to get your infection control cultural clues from. But first, let's look at some examples of what you're not going to do in the next slide. Isn't Google fantastic? This OzDoc article came to my email feed the day Veronica and I spoke about this ADC talk. This isn't a dentist, it's a cosmetic surgeon. And the surgeon was operating in a hospital in New South Wales, putting in a chin implant. And I've highlighted my favorite bit. This is what the surgeon said when he was interviewed. He said, unfortunately, I dropped the sterile implant on the floor. The implant was on the floor for less than five seconds. I instinctively picked it up and placed it immediately into a dish filled with betadine. It goes on and he did implant it into the patient's chin. And naturally he was reprimanded and had conditions placed on his registration. And he ended up removing the implant and replacing it. Next slide, please. Ah, it's interesting, isn't it, how Google works? This is an incident that happened eight years ago, yet it still comes to the top when you type this dentist's name into Google. In this case, because of poor hygiene standards, five dentists had their registration suspended. Another six dentists from the practice had restrictions placed on their registration and 11,000 people were asked to get blood tests done. And please note, there was only one practice owner. The rest of the dentists were either employees or contractors. 
And you know that 11,000 blood tests would have cost the Australian government over $1 million. So let's not get into Google this way. Next slide, please. The next is the who, who regulates infection control. You all know the Dental Board of Australia is that all powerful body which allows you to work as a dentist. Once you get the green light from the ADC, you head over to the Dental Board to register. From 2010 until 2022, the Dental Board had very defined requirements for infection control. But now the Dental Board has removed its prescriptive approach and offers an online resource page as guidance. The board will take any complaint about poor, poor hygiene practices really seriously. So it's important to understand that you're personally accountable for what happens where you work. It doesn't matter if you're an employee, a contractor, or have a service facility agreement. So the board is a federal regulator, which means it covers the whole of Australia. We also have state government laws and regulations that dictate what happens in dental practice. At present, if you're working in Queensland, ACT or New South Wales, you need to check their specific requirements. Be warned that the Dental Council of New South Wales makes it very clear on its website that they may inspect your practice without a specific complaint being made. Another odd one is notifiable diseases. I know a practice that was inspected because a patient had acquired hepatitis B and the health department wanted to eliminate the dental practice as a source. WorkSafe is um, a state-based work health and safety regulator. And if you buy a practice, you need to be aware of your obligations to your state's WorkSafe regulator. And if an employee complains or worse still gets injured or infected, then your WorkSafe regulator will be seriously looking at your workplace practices. And of course, the disposal of medical waste and sharps is controlled by state-based EPAs. All these regulators, both federal and state, look to external experts to give an evaluation of what is acceptable practice for dentists. And these experts are most likely to be guided by whatever the current ADA guidelines say. And it is a challenge to find out what the state-based regulations are and to keep up to date when they change. And this is one reason dentists join state-based ADA. So you have someone on your side helping you stay relevant and safe in that state. And the federal ADA is just a bonus to your med registration. So next slide, please. Why? Why have we ended up with this focus on dental infection control practices in Australia? Perhaps it is that dentists in Australia are so conscientious that they keep up with the science of infection control and they all make changes without anyone asking them. Or perhaps not. The ADA has actually been the one who's driven the high standard of infection control that you'll find in dentistry in Australia. And the annoying thing about the ADA is it is not going to stop and give you a break from changes. Historically, the ADA has changed its guidelines every three to four years. But the great thing about the ADA driving infection control is the government is very happy to largely leave the profession to self-regulate. Therefore, you don't have bureaucrats or hospital executives deciding what a small dental clinic needs to do, and you don't have regulators comparing you to large hospitals. And how it works is the ADA has an infection control committee made up of people of different expertise and experience. And the ADA represents the profession on national committees, which develop infection control standards or protocols, such as Australia's standards. And look at all the things I've listed as being part of the ADA's decision making. Being on the ADA committee is not as simple as it might seem. Next slide, please. 
And I just wanted to touch on what standards are because we have a new, um, we're about to have a new Australian standard for reprocessing reusable medical equipment. And this new standard will affect every dental practice. Everyone benefits in their everyday life from the use of standards. I've put a picture of my printer with some paper on it because it's an international, there's an international standard for paper sizes. And that's the reason you can buy A4 paper to fit in your printer. And you can buy a printer knowing that you'll be able to buy A4 paper or any other paper that will fix it. Similarly, you can only buy a steriliser in Australia that's made to the international standard so you know exactly what you're getting. In a hospital or dental practice, you know it's safe, there's a safe, consistent, reliable system in place for infection control. You want a temp nurse to walk into a system and know and understand it. This new standard is all about that and it's replacing outdated standards. Next slide, please. So now we're back to the what. Could you just tell me what I need to do? My husband is also a dentist. I used to come home from infection control meetings with all sorts of information. And he'd say, yes, but can you just tell me what to do? So I totally get that you may be thinking exactly the same thing today. But when I did tell him just what to do, it often ended up with an argument because he already already had his own ideas about what was normal and acceptable and he would protest that his decisions were science-based but he was influenced like the rest of us with the deep-seated cultural um, embedded biases. From the time you were born infection control biases were being embedded in you. This is my very cute four-year-old grandson Archie who you can see has quite a high tolerance for bugs. And remember the cosmetic surgeon that I told you about earlier who dropped the implant on the floor. He was so unaware of his cultural bias, he quoted the totally unscientific five second rule. That highly qualified doctor defaulted to what he'd learnt growing up rather than all his scientific knowledge. Archie here has quickly learned that his mother has a no second rule. And I can tell you school and university, my uni years resulted in me having a cultural bias for plastic barriers on every surface in a dental clinic. It's environmentally terrible, but very hard to let go of. And the people around us have a big influence on what we do. At some stage, you will ask yourselves, do dental practices really do what the ADA says? The ADA is a totally voluntary organisation and you might work in a practice where they say, no, no, no one ever really does that. I want to tell you that in the ADA 2021 guidelines, there was a new recommendation that practices need to stop the use of overbags for re retrieving objects from clean areas. So probably within four months after the directive, you could no longer buy overbags where we were in Australia. And I can assure you that suppliers would stock the product if the demand was present. That sort of influence is pretty impressive, isn't it? Next slide, please. So I agree. The big question is, what do I need to do? It's easy for the ADC exam because the ADC will follow the ADA guidelines. Hand hygiene shouldn't be a big deal because it will follow World Health Organization guidelines. If these aren't your standard practice today, you need to ask yourselves seriously why not. And just a reminder with hand hygiene that unless you're told otherwise, you'll start and finish every technical task as if it's the start of the day and you finish as if you're leaving to go home. And that's done in your assessment time, not in changeover time. As for the more practical aspects, plan for the unexpected. Nervous ADC candidates drop things or they get in the middle of doing something and realise they've forgotten to go and pick up a critical piece of equipment. 
Unfortunately, candidates who haven't planned for the unexpected waste a lot of energy and mental time anxiously trying to work out what they'll do. The unexpected may not happen in an exam, but it will definitely happen in your dental practice. Having thought about it and talked about it with colleagues and your DA and then plan what you might do, it will make you look like a professional to your patients regardless of the situation. When you drop something in the clinic, you will need to tell us what you would do in practice. In real practice, you're going to consider patient safety and good workflow in every instance of infection control. The infection control needs to be sensible and practical because the patients aren't going to be impressed with you leaving them in the middle of treatment. So I am at the end. As an ADC examiner, I would be looking to see that you can practice infection control in a way that is the current culturally accepted standard for the dental, our dental profession. However, as a member of a pretty fine profession, I hope I've helped you see the importance of staying up to date and actively deciding on a good cultural influence to ensure you stay at this high level for the whole of your professional life. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you so much, Glenda, for that excellent presentation. It's it's funny that you mentioned the five second rule because many of us grew up on that rule. Um, depending on the country, it probably varies the amount of seconds. Uh, but yeah, many times we have to leave that um, that baggage what that we bring with us because many things that we do are not necessarily the the right uh, thing to do. So especially. Um, Everyone who's here and who has heard about the five second rule, uh, we will never forget. And now we will put it in here. It's a no seconds rule. Please, everyone, um, we have to keep up with the standards, stay up to date, but always be safe and think of the workflow. And we don't have to sacrifice the safety and um, the wellness of our, of our patients. Thank you so much, Glenda, for your time, for your presentation. And don't forget that we'll be back with you for um, some questions at the end of this first session. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, now we're going to move to the second topic of this ADC forum. Uh, and that's going to be practicing dentistry in metro versus rural settings. Um, thank you, Martin, for being with us today. How are you? Your mic is off. There, that's it. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you. So I will introduce Dr. Martin Paul very briefly, and then he'll go on with his presentation. So um, Dr. Martin Hall is Chief World Health Advisor. There's a little bit of echo in there. That's it. Dr. Martin Hall is the Chief Oral Health Advisor at Dental Health Services Victoria, and he has over 40 years of experience as a dentist working to improve the oral health of vulnerable populations, both in Australia and overseas. He previously held positions in the New South Wales as the Principal Dental Officer Mid-North Coast Health Services and in Victoria as Senior Dentist General Manager, Clinical and Oral Health Services, at North Richmond Community Health. He is an honor honorary enterprise fellow in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, a junk professor at La Trobe University School of Rural Health, and director of COSNIEN, an oral health project in East Timor. Martin was inducted into the International College of Dentistry in 2015. His current role as Chief Oral Health Advisor for Dental Health Services Victoria includes the development of preventive-based models of care within Victoria's public oral health services. He has recently returned from six months as the Chief Dental Officer for the Northern Territory, and Martin's presentation today will be focusing on the practice of dentistry in metro versus rural settings. Martin, I'll leave you to have this screen. Trini, I'll just share my screen.
I hope you can all see that. So th thank you, Trini, and thank you, Australian Dental Council, for having me here this afternoon. I'm uh, going to speak about the um, practicing in rural and metro, metro areas uh, in Australia. Um, most of what I'm going to say is from personal experience, and I'm hoping that um, the information provided today will help candidates when they uh, when they graduate from the ADC uh, exams to help them make decisions on where to uh, where to work. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of, of traditional owners of the country throughout Australia. Um, Oh, hang on. Sorry. Right, uh, we're sharing again. Um, and um, oh, sorry about that. Um, and the I pay my respects to the elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. I'm coming from you from the lands of the Karana, the Kana people of the Adelaide Plains, which is where I was born and where I grew up and where I eventually graduated in 1980 from the um, Adelaide University um, Dental School. As a, as a new graduate, I um, joined the school dental service and that's when I started my rural service. Um, First of all, in a mobile dental truck heading out into the country. Um, and I did that for, for one year before um, uh, being sent to a rural country town north of Adelaide called Port Augusta. Since then, I've worked in four capital cities and seven country towns across Australia and several uh, remote and very remote uh, settings. So, uh, when you think of Australia, quite often you think of the, the bushman, the outdoors life, working off grid. However, uh, more than 90% of Australians live in urban areas. So that image isn't quite correct. If we look at this, um, if we look at this uh, graph, you can see across Australia the different proportions of uh, people who live in the cities, capital cities and rural areas. For example, if you are looking for a job in Victoria, um, South Australia or Western Australia, you're more likely to be in an urban area. Whereas if you're looking for work in Queensland or Tasmania, where more than 50% of the people live in the rural settings. Right. Oh, this is a bit slow. There. Sorry, a bit of technical. So where uh, the rest of the people live in rural areas, with 20% in the regional centres for populations of greater than 50,000 already. And Victoria, large rural centres. Um, the percent in country towns, um, the large ones up in 15,050, places like Gladstone, Tari, Mildura, we were talking about and there's hundreds of small uh, country towns. Um, then there's the 2% uh, of Australians who live in remote areas like First Island or Alice Springs. So where are all the dental practices? Well, they're distributed pretty much evenly across Australia with regard to the population, except with perhaps uh, Northern Territory and Tasmania under representative, with uh, Northern Territory has over 1% of the population, but only 0.5% uh, of the dental practices and Tasmania has over 2%, but only 1.3% of dental practices. So if we look at that a little bit more in detail, the red dots would be uh, public dental practices and the blue dots are um, uh, private dental practices. And you can see that they're concentrated in the 
capital cities and also along the eastern seaboard and the southeast of um, Australia. And a lot of nothing in the middle, which is uh, part of Australia's makeup. Now, if we look at the dental workforce rates per 100,000, this graph over here shows the difference between major cities through um, inner region, outer region, uh, remote and very remote. You can see that uh, there's uh, less dentists per 100,000 as we move away from the cities. If we translate that into a different ratio, in the cities, there's roughly one dentist to 1,200 people and in remote areas, it's um, more like four, one, in 4, 000, one to 4,000. So I'd like to just run through um, some of the pros and cons of working in the different, different parts of Australia. If we look at the metro, it's not surprising and it's quite common sense to understand there's gonna be a greater range of practices, uh, both private and public, where you may, uh, may, may be employed and there'd be greater flexibility with part-time or a mix of public and private. But you'll find that there's a greater competition for those jobs in the metro area. Um, uh, in the metro area, you're going to find a, a greater access to training and professional development. There's greater specialist support and peer support within the cities. Um, regarding lifestyle, if you have an extended family, you might want to stay in the metro area to keep in touch with them. Uh, you also have greater choices of entertainment, health services, schools in the city. However, along with that, there's a certain amount of stress re related to uh, daily travel, cost of living is higher in the cities, and cost affordability is uh, less favourable in. Um, the metropolitan areas. If we just bring up, here it comes, the uh, in region areas, um, rural areas, you'll find that because of that, that, um, of that uh, density of dentists, there's, there's high demand for both uh, in the for dentists in both the public and private sector. That enables you to have some sort of negotiations regarding salary, and particularly in the public service, and looking at incentives. Uh, you'll find that there's a range of practices from large corporate in the regional areas through to solo practices in the smaller rural towns. And because of the lack of uh, dentists, you'll find that your books are probably going to be full fairly quickly in when you go to the rural areas. However, uh, you would be expected to be on call and you might find yourself too busy in those regional areas. When it comes to professional, the, um, the job satisfaction is generally higher in rural areas. Uh, there's that sense of, of community service in an area of need. However, there's gonna be less access to specialists, um, although you will get visiting specialists or access through uh, to them via telehealth is more common these days. Um, generally, you'll find that um, when you work in a rural practice, your uh, scope of practice will be broader and that your skills development will be quicker. Uh, this is because the, uh, the community is expecting you to do most treatments rather than um, than to refer to a specialist. There's, although there's gonna be less CPD available, you will find that local professional groups come together and have regular meetings uh, for uh, professional support, but also for CPD with invited guests quite often. Um, you might find a different type of service in the rural versus urban, probably with more emergency and less prevention. This um, related to the levels of health literacy, which are less in the rural areas, and uh, people have less um, regulatory visits. Um, uh, mentoring and peer support access in the urban areas. You'll 
find that in the regional centres, cultural and arts are well developed. We find good schools. In fact, people move from various parts of uh, Australia to places like Ballarat and Bendigo, where the schools are very, um, are very reputable schools are there. In general, the cost of living and household affordability is less. Uh, is more favourable in the rural areas. Most of the hospitals are probably less to specialist care. And as you move to the more smaller, smaller rural towns, you have less options, more travel. You usually find a GP there. Across the rural setting, you find that um, the activities are more based around community and family centred. You have um, you know, through the schools, community groups, um, the service service um, um, service groups as well. Um, less daily travel, less traffic, a healthier environment with uh, less stress and less pollution. And you, if you're into sports and recreation, the access to camping, fishing, bushwalking, uh, et cetera, is, is just um, very much easier in the rural areas. Uh, partner employment is contentious. That would de depend on which um, which places and, and how much um, research you've done beforehand. Um, my experience with uh, working in rural would uh, would say that the more laid back lifestyle than in the metro area, and more engagement with the community, which has a, a level of satisfaction. Um, moving to remote. Now, some parts of Australia are very remote. This, uh, this sign will give you some indication of that. So with uh, remote, there's normally it would be a fly-in, fly-out from a metro or regional base. There's employment opportunities through the Royal Flying Doctor Service. They employ dentists to go uh, and you can fly out or, or go out in cars to com remote communities or Aboriginal community controlled health organisations often uh, have dental practices embedded in their um, health centres. The, uh, the, you may be the only dentist in a remote setting. Uh, however, you work with a team of um, health workers uh, through the uh, health centre. And I would say for lifestyle, you, uh, it'd be more for the adventurous to go to the remote areas. So that's just a, uh, a, you can get access to that, uh, that matrix there. Now, I also did a bit of uh, research into um, articles that have been written, and I found one by uh, Len Crocombe in 2016, which, um, it was very interesting, and it, it talks about the uh, a survey that was done on uh, rural dentists. And uh, the main factor for them was long-term income security, and that was um, whether to that was their decision whether to move in or stay in rural areas. And once that had to be established, that had to be then it had to that had to be satisfied before other factors were considered. And some of those considerations were that the rural practice is, is a great, it's great for developing clinical skills quickly, as rural practitioners provide a wider range of clinical services than and the community treatments working in rural practice. Um, the other comment from that um, survey was that rural practitioners felt valued for services to the local community and the great with a great sense of clinical pride and job satisfaction. They felt that they had uh, status in the local community and enjoyed is one of the big classes for working rural. There was another article um, uh, by uh, Mark Tennant in 2005 and this, the quote from that is that the rural practice is facilitated by the local area being able to meet their lifestyle needs for the individual dentists and their families, with most important 
being uh, family concerns such as the quality of schooling and uh, employment opportunities for partners. So I guess in summary, uh, once the financial sustainability uh, in a rural practice is achieved, complex factors such as lifestyle, life stage and family concerns influence the decision to stay working rurally. Um, and the success in a rural area is based on a combination of the ability to join in with the local community, feel part of that community, a sense of personal family satisfaction uh, from that laid back lifestyle and the job satisfaction within that particular rural context. And, and that would mean that you would need to explore each rural um, setting to make sure that it fits your uh, lifestyle and uh, professional um, objectives. And I'll, um, I'll be available for questions uh, later. So thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much for that. I think we were having um, some connection problems. Um, that's technology. Oh. No, no, just a little bit. Uh, but I think Martin was just trying to make a point. Sometimes we're not in the big metropolitan areas with the best connection or connectivity, and we just need to put up with it. And um, I guess the more engagement we manage to like create with the people that are in front of us and not across the other side of the world or across the other side of the country, um, the more satisfaction we're gonna, we're gonna get. So thank you for that, Martin. We will see you in a few minutes after the next presentation for our panel discussion. So next we have Kelly. So Kelly, Hi. how are you, Kelly? <laughs> Good, thanks, Trini. So Kelly will be talking about providing care to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And just a little bit about Kelly. Um, she is a proud Warrimi woman from the Hunter in New South Wales and a registered dental clinician for over 10 years as a dental hygienist and oral health therapist with Adult Scope. With over 14 years in the dental industry and experience in both private and public health practice, including Aboriginal dental clinics such as Awabakal and Eleanor Duncan Dental, Kelly is passionate about advocating improving oral health and overall health outcomes for the mouth and, with, and within her community. She currently works as a clinical educator and lecturer of Bachelor of Oral Health Therapies Pro therapy program at the University of Newcastle and holds a position at the Australian Dental Council as an accreditation committee member representing Indigenous Australian clinicians. So Kelly is here to talk about the importance of providing care to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Thank you, Kelly. The mic is all yours. Thank you, Trini. Um, some of those names are very difficult to pronounce and we do understand that but you did a really good job um, with pronouncing those um, Aboriginal names as well. So Veronica are you able to share my slides please? Thank you. So good evening everyone. Um, it's been a really interesting um, lecture so far and webinar and I'm just happy to be a part of it. So thank you for being here and listening. So my name is Kelly Gleason, as Trini has just said, and I'm a proud Waramai woman and oral health therapist. And tonight I'll be presenting a lecture on providing culturally appropriate and safe dental services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, just the next slide, please. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I am on today, the Awabakal people, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as forward any, any respects to any First Nations people I am presenting to today. So with this map of Australia, I wanted to show the multitude of traditional Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clan groups. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples refer to their families and bloodlines as clan groups or mob. And it is important to recognise that all clans have different customs, practices and beliefs and languages. 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are also the oldest living civilization in the world, estimated to be over 65,000 years old. And commonly in Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are known as First Nations peoples, having the longest living connection to Australia and the land, which is also known as country. Additionally, First Nations people have an intense connection to country that can impact their overall well-being. So for First Nations people, this country is not just a piece of land. It is our connection to spirit, ancestors, as well as our practices, our beliefs, and the foundation that forms our kingship and our identity. So with that all in mind, I so wherever you're from virtually, I'd like you, if you are virtually tuning in from Australia, I'd like you to have a think about um, what, where you are and then the First Nations people's land you can pay respects to. So just to the next slide, please. So before we begin, um, I know Trini's mentioned a little bit about my professional background, but um, just a little bit about me. So I am a proud Warramai woman and my ancestors were based along the New South Wales coast of Port Stephens with the mission itself situated in Karua, New South Wales. My ancestors were known as saltwater peoples and remembered as exceptional fishermen and boat builders. My late Nana Violet used to share stories of her and her siblings running along the riverbank, gathering oysters and crab hunting. And finding, I'm also always finding myself constantly drawn to the water for grounding. So I recognize that salt water runs in my blood. So Additionally, being a privilege to be a part of the Australian Dental Council Committee, representing a voice not only for clinicians, but the Australian and Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community. So throughout the presentation, I just wanted to mention a side note that I've utilised photos that are ethically sourced or I have permission for from my family and photos above are also of myself working. So we'll just go to the next slide, please, Veronica. So in order to provide culturally inappropriate safe dental services, it is important to first understand Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's background and history within Australia. So what we'll cover in today's lecture is traditional relationships with oral health, a brief history of colonisation impacts and intergenerational trauma, modern relationships with oral health, overall health impacts, social determinants of health, barriers to oral health services, and finally, our role in providing culturally appropriate and safe dental services. Just to the next slide, please. So starting with First Nations people's traditional oral health and diet. So prior to colonization, evidence shows that dental diseases, including dental caries and periodontal disease, were uncommon amongst the First Nations population. And in fact, they had overall superior oral health in comparison to their European counterparts. First Nations people historically consumed a diet compromising mostly of a combination of plants and animals. However, their diets varied greatly throughout Australia and the Torres Strait, with islands and coastal areas such as Kuroa, when I mentioned, they traditionally had access to seafood, such as crab, fish and turtle. And inland, rural and remote areas had a variety of plants, fruits, seeds and insects. So both men and women were involved in food collection with men hunting the larger lean game animals, including kangaroo, wallaby and crocodile. So as we can see, the traditional diet had very low fermentable carbohydrate and sugar content with unprocessed foods that required vigorous and lengthy mastication. So this in turn promoted healthy saliva production, which assisted in keeping their oral cavities clean and healthy. So some foods did have some natural sugars, including honey and nectar. However, these were very difficult to obtain and were considered a luxury. First Nations people also had access to fresh water supplies and they were known to be nomadic, which means they walked over lengthy distances. So all these practices positively affected and helped their oral health and overall well-being. First Nations people were also um, the first scientists, which is a fun fact. They even dabbled in dentistry and they treated toothaches with a plant called the hot bush. So they used to grind this um, hot bush up and topically place it next to the area like a sedative effect. So just to the next slide, please. 
So after European colonisation in 1788, enforced policies stripped all the rights of First Nations people. This allowed government policies to dictate and control all aspects of their lives, including where they could live, where they could work, who, who they could marry and what they could eat. So as Europeans found First Nation traditional customs to be barbaric, First Nations people were forced to stop hunting and gathering for their nutritious, low fermental belt carbohydrate foods. So First Nations people then became dependent on the introduced European foods, including milk, tea, jam, flour, sugar, and tin meats. So they were forced into areas called missions that were fenced like cages. And European practices, including education and religion, was forced upon First Nations people. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were treated as second class compared to their European counterparts. And if they did not comply with enforced rules, they were killed. So full blood First Nations children were placed in fence missions, while half caste or mixed race First Nations children were forced into European homes in attempt to breed out First Nation genes. And this was known as the Australian government assimilation policy. These children lost the links to the kingship, their mob, as well as traditional customs and practices, and some were never actually reunited with family. These Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are known as the Stolen Generation. So it's important to emphasise the impacts of massacres, disposition, loss of freedom, and intergenerational trauma on the overall well-being of First Nations people. With their rights stripped, they had the inability to pass on kingship beliefs and cultural practices. So this is something which is most sacred for First Nations people, and these impacts are still having a major role in First Nations lives today. Just to the next slide, please. So it has just been over 55 years that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been counted as Australian citizens with the 1967 referendum. Australian citizens um, of, sorry, at the time, my father would have been six years old at the 1967 referendum, and my nana Violet would have been in her early 20s, and they still did not have basic human rights. So even though it is for historical events, it's still fair to say that they're very current in nature. So... As I've briefly discussed colonisation and intergenerational trauma impacts, please be aware that there is still a vast amount of research historical impacts that I have not covered that has also deeply affected First Nations people today. At the end of the presentation, I will provide you with referred resources for your own pursual. And I particularly want to share this fantastic resource that discusses the, in, in, the effects of intergenerational trauma on First Nations people today. It's a clever animation and it's called The Journey of Wellbeing, endorsed by the Western Australian Government. And it actually will really greatly assist with your understanding of historical Australian impacts. So although I do speak about the negative impacts, I cannot, cannot stress enough that First Nations people are unbelievably strong, proud and resilient. And I know my late Nana is here with me today um, presenting these important facts. So let's continue. So as we've reviewed traditional relationships, what is the first, what is the modern First Nations relationship with oral health look like today? So here are some current facts from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. So First Nations people are four times more likely to experience dental diseases than any other Australians. This is despite merely only being 3.8% of the Australian population, so four times the amount. 6% of First Nations Australian aged 15 and over were reported to have complete tooth loss, and 45% had at least lost one tooth. Finally, less than 5% of the remote First Nations children brush their teeth, so only 5% or less. And they are 1.5 times more likely to attend hospital for dental issues, which we all know um, adds to the burden um, in hospitals that we already have. So just to the next slide. So as we know, poor oral health significantly contributes to chronic diseases and vice versa. So first, 
Nations people have a notably higher occurrence of diseases, including type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and respiratory diseases, to name a few. These chronic diseases directly affect our good oral health, our treatment decisions, and overall well being outcomes for our patients. So, this is even more concerning as 37% of these diseases are preventable through lifestyle changes. Uh, that would include helping our patients reduce their sugar, their alcohol, tobacco sensation, and helping them increase water and physical activity. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women also have increased pregnancy complications, which heightens the occurrence of dental abnormalities and defects such as enamel hyperplasia. So in fact, 74.6% of First Nations children were found to have some degrees of enamel hyperplasia, which in turn increases their risk of sensitivity, caries, and ultimately tooth loss. Uh, just to the next slide, thanks. So consequently, higher occurrence of chronic diseases unfortunately leads to higher incidences of mortality. So the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare states that First Nations men and women have a mortality rate approximately seven to 10 years earlier than the non-Indigenous population, with over 65% of deaths occurring before they even reach the age of 65. The most common cause of death for First Nations people is cardiovascular disease, which accounts for over 25% of deaths, followed by cancers of the lungs, um, which is the most, which is the most highest occurring. And these facts are unfortunately especially very personal as my immediate family are a part of the statistics. I lost my father when he was only 59 years old from chronic diseases and my younger brother to suicide at the age of 28 years old. And mental health issues and suicide, unfortunately, is a major issue within the Australian and Torres Strait Islander community. Suicide was in fact the fifth leading cause of death in 2021, with 196 First Nations people losing their lives that year. So I understand that these facts are very confronting. They're confronting for me when I found them out as well. But facts that need to be shown to and, and discussed to ignite change. So just to the next slide, please. So why is this all happening in for First Nations people in modern Australia? So in conjunction with the previous history stated and intergeneral trauma, intergenerational trauma, sorry, research, research, sorry, research shows that oral health of any population is influenced by the social determinants of health. So according to the Australian National Oral Health Plan, First Nations people are known as a priority population or vulnerable with higher rates of lower socioeconomic status, which leads to less opportunities for adequate education and employment. So this significantly impacts First Nations people's access to basic shelter, water and food, let alone affording dental care products and dental services. Basic, basic cost of living is high. I know all my friends and family are feeling it, not just First Nations. Um, with sugary drinks and foods that represent the lowest cost option as they're easy, easy to store and they don't need to stay cold. And dental services or a toothbrush and toothpaste may just not be a priority for First Nations families who are struggling to afford the basic cost of living. So in fact, First Nations people are 1.5 times more likely to have difficulty paying a $100 bill compared to non-Indigenous counterparts. First Nations people also experience housing and poorer living conditions with overcrowding and the majority of houses do, and shelters do not even satisfy Australian standard living requirements. In some households, toothbrushes are often shared and they don't have adequate places to keep them clean. And finally, there are higher incidences of risky behaviour, including smoking, tobacco, drugs, and alcohol use, which we all know affects our oral health directly. So just to the next slide. So you're probably asking, isn't there already Australian government initiatives to improve First Nations in quality? Well, yes, there is, but, but are they working? 
So the Close the Gap journey began in 2005, which called for the Australian government to commit to achieving equality for First Nations people by 2031. However, 18 years on, we still haven't even come close to achieving targets with only four of the 15 that are on track. And some of the targets in the outcomes are actually getting worse because there's high rates of adult imprisonment as well as children in out-of-home care and increases in suicide. This target progress is just not good enough for me as a proud Woromai woman and First Nations representative. And as health professionals wishing to work within Australia and have the privilege of treating First Nations people, we need to ask ourselves, is this good enough for you? Just to the next slide, please. So what are the modern barriers to oral health services for our First Nations population? So in a report from the Australian Health and Welfare Institute of Australia in 2020, it was reported that Oh, sorry, it was estimated that 19% of First Nations people reported that they did not go to a dentist, even though they needed to in the previous 12 months. Some reasons included cost, being too busy or being embarrassed. But main barriers that are researched include feeling judged and stereotyped, with racism still well and alive today within the Australian population. And I can't tell you how many times I've been asked why my skin is so white if I'm Aboriginal or if I, I receive a free house and education. So I have mixed heritage and I'm equally proud of my backgrounds because it makes me the person I am today. The colour of my skin does not diminish my connection to the land and my culture. And to clarify, I did not receive a free house or education, nor do I know anyone who identifies that has I mean, it would be nice, wouldn't it? But it's still a stereotype. So you may have actually also heard of the landmark, the landmark, sorry, the landmark, the landmark case regarding the Australian doctor, which was which he was prohibited from providing any health services and cannot work for a minimum of twelve months after he was found to be offensive and discriminatory towards an identified First Nations health professor and professional. So it's important to understand that discrimination and racism of First Nations people, and in fact, any culture, it's not going to be tolerated, not just First Nations people. And it can affect your, your career long-term. So another barrier for First Nations people is to work and is to work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander identified people. So it's very hard to do so because there's not a lot of First Nations people that work in dentistry with our population only being 3.8%. Not everyone chooses this, this um, sort of career. So what can we do? So you can access the local community, um, as dental clinicians, we, we may not know where to refer to culturally appropriate medical services for our First Nations patients. So we can talk to the community, we can talk to the Aboriginal medical services, we can attend culturally um, appropriate events and, and immerse ourselves so we can learn more. There's also a noted absence of cultural competency training amongst staff and clinicians. Some clinicians are not aware that you can actually never achieve cultural competency through one-off course. And it's a lifelong lesson that we should always turn back to and repeat regularly. Just to the next slide, please. So is First Nations oral health my problem? Well, if you practice in any health field, including dentistry in Australia, yes, it is. If you practice in Australia, you are required to know your legal and ethical responsibilities as medical professionals. And it is important to follow APRA's code of conduct. So principle two of the code specifically relates to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and cultural safety. And the principle states, practitioners should consider the specific needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their health, cultural safety, including the need to foster open and honest, culturally safe professional relationships. But how can we do this? It's a tricky question. And what is our role in helping re to reduce the gap? Just to the next slide, please. 
So firstly, what we can do is undertake cultural awareness and responsive training regularly. So as previously mentioned, cultural competency can never be fully achieved and it is a life learning lesson. So it needs to be undertaken regularly. I do recommend the cultural um, responsive training course through the Indigenous Allied Health Australia. I was lucky enough to attend their course earlier this year with the Australian Dental Council in Melbourne. And it began some really fantastic and safe conversations in the workplace. Next would be to increase engagement, as I mentioned before. So what we could do is approach the local community you work in, have open discussions with First Nations people on their oral health priorities and what they would like to get out of improving their oral health. So it gives First Nations people empowerment over their oral their own oral health. People don't like to be told what to do. Um, let's have an open discussion. If you're unsure on how to be, uh, begin approaching the community, it's good to start connecting with the local Aboriginal Land Council or the Aboriginal Medical Service. And even if the community has one, um, First Nations run dental services are a really good spot to start. Engaging these First Nation run services will also provide you with a clear referral line to services, including medical, dietary, as well as cessation services for smoking, drugs and alcohol. Also, if you attend the AMS or these community events in person, this will help foster and build relationships with staff, patients, including doctors, Aboriginal health workers, and this will really foster your um, engagement as well. So, if we want our patients to improve dental habits, we know that oral health is multifaceted and many factors, including diet and overall health habits, greatly affect oral health outcomes. So to in order to genuinely improve First Nations patients' oral health, let's start making connections. Just to the next slide, please. So continuing on providing a culturally safe environment, so next we can use First Nations made resources, including oral health, smoking and dietary resources. And the image on the left, or if you're looking at it the right, um, is a is an image called Mob Smiles, and it's a which was directed by proud Gumbara woman and oral health therapist Kiralee Phillips and the Australian Dental Council. Kiralee worked with the ADA to create these amazing resources and they completely created by First Nations people for First Nations people, including the education, the art, the models and the photography. Um, and they're, they're completely free and downloadable. Another um, way that we can help is to respect First Nations people need uh, and their need for patience and time to build trust, especially with the historical and modern experiences they're still facing. It is human to quickly judge, but as health professionals in Australia, we need to refrain from this notion. Don't judge someone based on their current oral health, their current employment circumstances, or even if they're late. You don't know what each individual is going through personally. And yes, we like to stay on time and achieve as much as we can in each appointment. Realistically with First Nations people, due to history of intergenerational trauma and lack of trust with medical services, this may not happen. You need to spend, you may even just spend the entire appointment talking or as we call it with mob is yarning about medical or even family dynamics. Ask, ask about what, who they live with, ask about where they're from. And finally, again, let's appropriately engage First Nations people by building rapport. This means talking, but also listening. So remember, just as you have things to learn um, and they have things to learn from you, they you will also learn lots from your patients. Just to the next slide, please. So to conclude, um, as promised, here are some of the many First Nations resources I recommend. Um, and as the presentation is recorded, you will be able to have access to these resources yourself. So please feel free to share these with patients, um, other potential candidates and colleagues as well. And I would like to thank the Australian Dental Council um, team, as well as the other speaking candidates. 
And for everyone who's chimed in to listen today, I'm excited to have an increased dental force from all different countries, backgrounds, perspectives. And I'd like to thank you for considering working in Australia. And I hope we've all learned something today. There's really great presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for that presentation. Um, we have 550 people from all over the world, as I said before. So what you're telling us and the way you say it, it's just, it's so inspirational. And I hope everyone's getting the message because when you come from different countries, sometimes you don't have that cultural background and that makes it so important. Putting things in context to be able to practice in a better, in a more appropriate way uh, make people feel comfortable, be able to personally treatment decisions and improving the outcomes. That's what we need to do. And especially um, as overseas trained uh, practitioners, it is vital for us to know um, that history, that culture, the background, because we are not just treating, but we have a massive role as um, supporters of our patients and, and a role as educators as well. So thank you so much for your for your presentation today, Kelly. Thank you, Trini. That was amazing. And please don't go, we're gonna call back um, Glenda and Martin, please come back for the panel discussion. So I am, hello, Glenda, welcome back. And Martin, are you there? Yes, I'm here, but I've had to change um... <laughs> System, so I don't know what's happened to my uh, video. That's okay. We can hear you at least. Um, so as long as we know you're there, that's all good. I would like to remind uh, remind all participants that um, we've been receiving questions um, through the forum email, and thank you all for your questions. So we are going to have one question for each one of the presenters: one for Glenda, one for Martin, and one for Kelly. And if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to send it to us. And um, in the next week, we will be sending the answers back if they are very important questions and um, we, see, uh, we see them um, being repeated in there. Okay, so we're gonna start with Glenda. Um, are there concessions for infection control practices outside metropolitan areas? Infection control is the good thing about Australia is we've got the same standard Australia wide. So no, <laughs> because we want the same standard in every part of Australia. That's exactly right. So short and sweet answer. Um, there are no concessions, no different uh, treatment for rural or very remote and big metropolitan areas no seconds rule all over the country thank you so much Glenda is there anything else you would like to add no thank you so much then we have our next question for Martin are there any spe any special travel arrangements for patients in rural areas who need specialist treatment uh well the short uh not really there um, most of the patients that are seen in rural are going to be private uh, patients and they will need to find their own way into specialist services. Um, in the public sector, then uh, there is um, there's work underway to decentralise the um, in Victoria, especially a decentralised specialist services and the public service uh, specialist will go out to regional hubs, which will, uh, one of the principles of um, we try and apply is that we take services to the people uh, to reduce travel. And uh, as we know, people working, uh, people living in rural settings have poorer oral health because they don't get access to uh, general dentistry, let alone uh, specialist dentistry. If you work in a remote community, there is a scheme called the patient assistant travel um, schedule, which um, if you do need emergency care, then you do get uh, transported out, but not for general dental work. Um, 
unfortunately. So um, one of the uh, uh, disadvantages of working in, we're living in a rural area is that there's more travel involved. One of the benefits of COVID-19 was the introduction and the advancement of uh, telehealth. So one of the better systems is to actually do the diagnosis or consultation for a tele-consultation system, either through video or even telephone. And uh, that can actually reduce the amount of travel required into specialist services. So it, it enables more um, care to be provided locally. That's about it. Thank you so much, Martin, for that. So there are some special travel arrangements like aids from the government, uh, but I guess it's never enough. Never enough. Hopefully we'll be able to go and work in those rural areas and providing better services closer to the people um, as opposed to all going to the metropolitan areas and overcrowding those areas when there's so much need outside of the big cities. So thank you, Martin, for that. And I now- Follow on from that is, is that when you work in a rural setting, you are expected to sort of push, push your scope of practice uh, to the higher level. And uh, that's an expectation from the community, but also uh, it's a self-development so that you, you, I mean, not not um, beyond your uh, competency, but to, to push the level to where you, rural dentists do send, seem do tend to have a broader scope of practice, and uh, because of that travel factor, they might get advice from a specialist, but actually do the work themselves are uh, in their in their practice. So, that, that is so true. Many times when we have a lot of support around, we get complacent and we tend to refer more than we should. And there was actually a question like that um, sent by one of our participants and he was asking about uh, providing care to children and, and doing a pulpotomy if you're not a specialist. Many times we get comfortable and we have people to refer this, um, these cases, but we are actually qualified um, as a pre-graduate uh, requisite, I guess. I guess. Um, we learn so much like more than what we actually do when we graduate. And when you go to these rural places, you do need to push yourself. And it's not that you're not qualified for it. It's not that you don't have the knowledge, but oh, maybe if we have someone that likes to do that, like in the box right next to us, we'll send it to the doctor next to, uh, to us. And um, sometimes we don't have that, that chance, that possibility, and we just need to push ourselves and, and get comfortable. We're not going out of our uh, scope of, of practice. And if there is something that you don't feel you're qualified for, then don't do it. Fair enough. But if you think what's the cost and benefit of what you're going to be doing, if no one else is around to do it, just go for it. Do it well. Study before. Uh, make sure that you have what you need and, and do it the best you can. Uh, but yeah, as, as long as as long as we can we can help our patients in a responsible way, we can do it. Thank you for that. And now our next question is for Kelly. So Kelly, what is your advice to effectively communicate with indigenous patients and raise awareness of the importance of prevention of oral diseases in a sensitive manner, taking into consideration the pa uh, the patient's cultural beliefs? Well, this sort of goes off what you just mentioned as well, Trini, with um, pushing ourselves. Um, so just like when we learn um, at school with dentistry, everything we learn, we have methodologies and ways of doing things. Um, but really, not everything always goes to plan. So we've got to um, learn from those experiences. And those experiences are usually lived. It's not something we can just read and and know how to do so to get comfortable with delivering and communicating um culturally appropriate services for aboriginal and torres strait islander people we need to continue learning um through cultural awareness training we need to we need to liaise and and talk to professionals and aboriginal and torres strait islander professionals we need to also um immerse ourselves in the community go and have a conversation have a yarn and that's the only way we're going to get comfortable is to continuing learning. 
that is right. So go out there, engage with the community, get to know your patients, maybe um, in a reasonable way. But yeah, if you get to put everything in the background, especially when we come from overseas and we see at the beginning that everything is so different, don't get uncomfortable, don't be afraid, just just try and put yourself in um, in the community, in their shoes and, and, and try and conduct yourself in an appropriate manner manner and enjoy it. Just do it respectfully. And there's always um, community events, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are always welcoming. They want people to get involved. It doesn't matter where you're from. They just want to share their stories. And that's what, what we've always done as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is continuing to share stories to learn. That is right. Thank you so much today, guys. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Kelly, for your time today. I'm not sure if you're going to stay for the session too, but uh, for now, we're going to conclude the session one of this uh, first ADC candidate forum. And I would like to thank you all again. Thank you all the, the um, candidates that are uh, joining us today from all over the world. Let me have a look. We have 534 people from all over the world today. So we really appreciate you guys uh, for your time, for your excellent presentations, for all that valuable information that you've given us today. And I'll let you go for now and we'll move on to session two. Thanks, Trini. Thank you, Martin. Okay. So uh, moving on to the second part of our uh, forum, we are going to have um, a presentation about the APRA registration process. I know there's some people asking about this, and I know many of you will be getting your pen and papers to take notes because this is the first thing you're going to be doing when you pass your exams. So get ready. Um, we're going to be talking about how the Australian Dental Association supports candidates to successfully practice in Australia. And finally, we're going to talk about the Dental Practitioner Support Program. So that's session two of this ABC Candidate Forum. And we're going to start with APRA. So APRA registration process. We have Ben and Mark. Hello and welcome um, to this forum. How are you today? Great, thanks very much for having us today. Thanks, Trini, thank thanks for having us. Thank you for your time. So um, before I give you the mic, I'm just gonna present you. We have adjunct associate professor Ben Keith. Uh, he's a manager in clinical input service at APRA for the dental and multi-professional uh, profession teams advisor. He has worked with APRA since 2013 and previously was a professional member at the Victorian Civil and Administrative uh, administrative Tribunal. From 2007 to 2013, Ben was the Clinical Director of Dentistry and Oral Health at La Trobe University, establishing Australia's first rural dental and oral health school. He was Chair of the Continuing Professional Development Committee for eight years at the Australian Dental Association Victorian branch and held roles with ADA committees in the federal and Victorian branches, as well as being a council member of the Victorian branch. He has worked with the ADC as an examiner and in assessing programs of study and is currently an examiner with the University of Melbourne Doctor and Dental Surgery Program. And we have Mark Ford. He's the Acting Executive Officer Dental at APRA. Mark joined APRA in 2022 with extensive experience in process, process improvement and policy implementation, having held roles across education, health and government. Mark's most recent role with APRA has been a senior policy and project officer before stepping into the role of acting executive officer dental. Before joining APRA, Mark, Mark worked with the ADC as director in accreditation and quality assurance, where he was responsible for managing the ADC's accreditation of dental, uh, dental education programs and where he implemented the most recent revisions to approve accreditation standards and work to review the professional competencies of newly qualified practitioners. So Ben and Mark are here to talk about how to apply for APRA registration after the completion of the ADC process. 
Mark and Ben, the mic is all yours. Thanks very much, Trini. So I'm just going to start this off. All right. So um, thank you very much for having us. And I would like to start by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land on which I join the meeting from today. I'm on Wurundjeri country, part of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, what I'd like to do today is just start by giving a quick overview about what I'll talk about, and then we'll, we'll launch into each of those areas. So I'll give a little bit of detail about APRA, who APRA and the Dental Board are and what our roles are, uh, some of the obligations we expect of registered health practitioners, and then talk through about applying for registration um, with the Dental Board of Australia and cover off things like declarations, uh, certification requirements, um, English language, criminal history and impairment, and also some detail about maintaining your registration before finishing off with some details about if you've got further questions or queries, who you can contact or where you can gather further information. First and foremost, I guess, APRA and the Board of the Dental Board of Australia are established under the Health Practitioner Regulation National Law, or we just refer to it as the National Law, and it's a state and territory-based law which is consistent across the country. Um, so when you hear somebody talking about the National Law in registration, that's what we're referring to. The National Law establishes the Dental Board, it establishes APRA, it also regulates 16 health professions and establishes the 15 National Boards. So it's not just dental that's covered under this, it's medicine, it's nursing, it's pharmacy, it's 16 different health professions. APRAs and the Board work together to register dental practitioners and that's registering practitioners in all five divisions of general registration we recognise here in Australia. So that's dentists, oral health therapists, dental hygienists, dental therapists and dental prosthetists. It also is the 13 dental specialties that are recognised in Australia and also manages the area of endorsement we recognise referred to as conscious sedation. The Board and APRA's primary role is really about protecting the public. We're not here to represent the professions, we are here to protect the public, and we do that by registering practitioners who have been determined to be safe and confident and qualified to practice safely and ethically. Very quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail about the obligations of registered health practitioners and what you need to do and what you need to do to maintain your registration. So before you can start practicing in Australia, you must be registered with the board. There is no way around that. You must be registered with the board. In doing that, you apply to APRA and we process that on behalf of the board. Once you are registered, you are expected to meet the board's standards, codes and guidelines. And that includes the recency of practice registration standard, as well as the continuing professional development registration standard and the professional indemnity insurance standard as well. You're also required to renew your registration on an annual basis, pay your registration fee, and notify the board of any changes to your principal place of practice. You also have obligations relating to notification, uh, notifying if uh, you become aware of a mandatory notification requirement, and those cover things like a practitioner who might be practicing under the influence of drugs or alcohol, or um, uh, some of those sorts of more serious issues which the board and APRA would manage and, uh, and deal with. You're also required to notify in writing within seven days if you've been charged or convicted of an offence, punishable one more than 12 months jail. You're also required to comply with other legislation, territory, state and territory laws. It's not just the national law that you must comply with when you're working as a dental practitioner in Australia. Other things like drugs and poisons laws and regulations must be complied with for practitioners who are using or prescribing medicines. And also things like radiation safety, so accessing or, or um, producing uh, radiographs, for example. Those are state and territory laws that you must comply with, and there are those requirements you're expected to know and be aware of. You also must, um, I guess, what I'll quickly do now, though, is actually go through applying for registration and give you a bit of an idea of information and where you can find that information. So once you've completed the ADC's process to show you're qualified for registration, then you will need to apply to register with the board. You can see here, I've taken a screenshot of the board's website and you can find the forms to apply for registration under the registration, under the registration tab and forms. It's also available here from this URL as well. These are easily accessible uh, on the board's website. When you're applying for registration, there's a lot of information and detail you need to have available. We need your personal details, like your name, your email, your address, your phone number. 
We also need your identification documents. We need to verify who you are when you're applying for registration, and these must be correctly certified. We need details of your qualifications, so what, where you completed your initial qualification in dentistry, as well as details of your ADC um, examination and successfully passing that. Be aware that we do actually confirm with the ADC those past details as well. So we expect that you will attach a certificate to the application, but we will also confirm that with the ADC. The board's required to have registration standards in a range of areas, and one of those includes the English language registration standard. Um, so you are expected to have a level and proficiency of English that would allow you to safely practice in Australia. You must also organise for a certificate of good standing to be sent to ARPA and the board to verify your standing um, when you've been registered in another jurisdiction, and that applies for every jurisdiction in which you've been registered. There is a limitation as to the time frame of that. And you must also apply uh, to undertake an international criminal history check, having lived and worked overseas for more than six months as an adult. You're also required to provide your CV with that uh, application, and there's a board-specific uh, CV format, which is available to download, and then also in complete the payment details. So when you initially apply for registration, you're um, paying an application fee as well as your annual registration fee. Each year you renew, then then will be a registration fee only that's payable thereafter. I'll go through a bit more detail about what's involved in the registration process. So when you are applying for registration, you are required to make a number of declarations. These are included on the registration form, which you'll complete and then upload into ARPA system. You will and uh, you will need to be aware that when you are answering those declarations, it's important to answer those honestly. If you are providing false or misleading information, that is a contravention of the national law, and that may lead to refusal of your application for registration, or it may also lead to health conduct or performance action being taken against you under the national law. And that could be everything from refusal, cancellation of registration, or applying conditions to your registration. So be aware that it's very important as you complete the form for uh, applying for registration to do so honestly. You also have to make sure that when you're providing information that you are correctly certifying your documents as part of that process. Our certification requirements are a little bit different from some other organisations, so it's important to make sure you're aware of what these are. There's information available on ARPA's website to allow you to make sure you're complying with those requirements. There are also different requirements if you're certifying things like a photo ID or other documents like, that don't actually have photo ID. So if you are submitting photo ID, like an international passport, for example, it must state on there that um, the authorised officer who's actually certifying the document, that it is a true and copy of the original and the photograph is the true likeness of the person presenting the document as cited by me. That's required to be written by the authorised officer who's verifying or certifying your documents. Be aware that all IDs need to be verified except electronic visas and the certifier must provide proof of what entitles them to be an authorised officer. There's details in the instructions for applicants in terms of what they're required to do or who they're required to be. So I encourage you to have a look at that document. It is an area where we see that applications are delayed. So getting it right the first time is a really important step in making sure that your application can be processed quickly and efficiently. And you can do that by downloading the certifying documents instruction for applicants from the ARPA's website. I'd also encourage you to take that document with you to the authorising officer so they can see what's required of them and that hopefully will avoid delays or any issues with your certification process. Another important part is we're required to identify, um, to verify your identity as part of the process. We need to make sure that the person who's applying for registration and whose documents are being submitted is the person they say they are. So we do need several forms of identification from you as part of that application process. Each one must be correctly certified as we've just discussed. And if you've changed your name, we need to see evidence of this and it must be official certificates or official government issued documents. We also make sure that the address you're providing us matches the application address you put onto documentation and be aware we can't accept electronic documents except for Australian visas. They must be hard copies, scans or photographs of those hard copies that are appropriately certified. Also be aware that there have been some recent changes to the present in person requirement. So if you've seen those before on the ARPA website, that document's just been updated, which will make it easier for people located overseas 
to verify um, or to provide, to provide proof of their identity. Also be aware that all documents must be submitted in English and you must have a translation for anything being submitted in another language. You can refer to www.arpra.gov.au forward slash backwards, sorry, slash translate for further detail. Or you can search the ARPRA website to find that information as well. In terms of English language requirements, the board is required to make sure that all applicants for initial registration demonstrate their English language skills are suitable, that their English language skills are suitable for registration. And we do this by applying the English language skills registration standard, which sets out how you can demonstrate to the board that you're competent to speak and communicate in English to practice the dental profession in Australia. There are different ways in which you can do that, but it may involve you taking an English language test, which is recognised by the board. Be aware that you must include details of that on your application for registration. So you must have taken that test if that's required under the registration standard prior to submitting your application for registration. In terms of criminal history, which is another element of the document that you'll be submitting for registration, um, be aware that criminal history includes every charge made for an offence, it includes every plea of guilty or a finding of guilt, whether or not a conviction has been recorded, and every conviction as well. Spent conviction legislation doesn't apply to arborist checks. We are required to make sure that you are of good standing and, and a fit and proper person to be able to be registered as a health practitioner in Australia. And your application may be delayed if you don't provide us with this information. As part of applying for registration, you will be consenting to ARPRA to undertake a criminal history check here in Australia. And that could be done at any time that you're a registered practitioner. So bear in mind that it may not just be at the point at which you register. ARPRA regularly audits by undertaking criminal history checks to ensure that you're complying with the requirements of the registration standard. And as we talked about before, that does include things like advising us within seven days if you are actually charged or you are convicted of a criminal offence. Also be aware that as an internationally qualified practitioner, you've lived overseas for a period of greater than six consecutive months, you will need to complete an international criminal history check. You will need to request and pay for this through an ARPRA approved supplier. And there's details of who the approved suppliers are on ARPRA's website. You will be provided with a check reference number and an ICHC reference page, which you must include with your application. The results of the International Criminal History Check are provided directly to APRA, and we cannot register you until we've received and considered the results of that. Also be aware that reports are only valid for three months from the date of issue. So it is important to make sure that when you are submitting your information, you've also got your English language test completed and you're submitting all your documents at once. There can also be implications for recency of practice. So you've completed your ADC certificate. You also need to complete your international criminal history check and your English language uh, skills test and make sure that those are all submitted in good time. Otherwise, it might impact the board's ability to register you if we go well over 12 months from the point at which you completed the ADC's examination process. One other area you'll be asked about is whether or not you have an impairment as you go through the registration process. Now, we don't need you to declare well-managed health conditions that don't affect your ability to practice, things like wearing glasses or maybe if you sprained your wrist. We do need you to declare any conditions which are likely to detrimentally affect your practice. And the national law defines impairment in relation to practitioners as a physical or mental impairment, a disability, condition or disorder, including substance abuse or dependence that detrimentally affects or is likely to detrimentally affect your capacity to practice. If in doubt, declare the impairment. ARPA and the National Board will take that into consideration as part of the registration process. If it's a well-managed condition, it's not going to be an issue with you moving through registration. The other part, I guess, that I just wanted to briefly touch on is about maintaining your registration. So once registered, you must continue to meet the board standards, codes and guidelines, including undertaking regular continuing professional development. And as a dental practitioner, the registration standard requires you complete 60 hours over a three year period and you keep records of what you've undertaken. You must also maintain your recency of practice and must be able to keep evidence for at least five years. You also are required to be covered by professional indemnity insurance relevant to your practice. 
you must also comply with the board's code of conduct, which defines the professional behaviour and conduct we expect of a registered practitioner here in Australia. So these are really important documents you should be familiar with as a dental practitioner in Australia. There's lots of information available on ARPRA and the board's website. And once you've applied for registration, you will receive regular email communication about the progress of your application, whether or not there's anything missing or whether or not anything needs to be clarified or added. If you have queries or questions, you can also contact ARPRA's customer service team. The numbers are there and they're available on ARPRA and the Dental Board's website, or you can visit um, the websites. And there is a special page available for international practitioners looking to try and bring together all that information to make it available to you in an easy format. Trini? Thanks very much. I'll stop sharing now, pass back to you. Thank you so much for that information. I'm pretty sure everyone took notes and there's lots of questions coming uh, through through the, uh, the chat. So please uh, be patient. You will get answers um, probably in the next few weeks. Um, we will be sending all the, um, the information that is uh, relevant to the presentation. Uh, but that was pretty clear, pretty pretty straightforward. There's um, some websites in here and the information is laid out pretty clear in there as well. So thank you so much for your time and we will have you back um, at the end of session two with some questions for you. And now we are going to move on to the next presentation, how the Australian Dental Association supports candidates to successfully practice in Australia. And we're going to welcome Scott Davis. Uh, Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? Thank you for the invitation. Thank I'm good, you. thank you. I hope my sound is working. <laughs> it's perfect. Perfect on this side. So Dr. Okay. Scott Davis is a consulting prosthodontist based in Port Macquarie, New South Wales, who has specialist, uh, special interest in full mouth rehabilitation and implant dentistry. Scott has been involved with the, uh, the Australian Dental Association since 1998, including as a New South Wales branch councillor for 14 years and branch executive council member for four years. And he's currently the federal president of the ADA. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you. Um, he is also a member of several ADA federal standing committees, including Constitution and Policy Committee, the Specialist Working Group and, the, and Dental Instrument Materials and the Equipment Committee. Other dental te uh, technical committee involvement includes representation of the ISO and AS plus liaison with committee with the Therapeutic Goods Administration, CSIRO and the Department of Veteran, uh, Veteran Affairs. And Scott will be talking to us about how the ADA supports candidates to successfully practice in Australia. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone. And I, I wish you well in your endeavors with the, your examinations. The Australian Dental Association is the peak professional organization for dentists and dental students in Australia with over 17,000 members. Our primary objectives are to encourage the improvement of oral and general health of the public, promote the ethics, art, science of dentistry, and support members to provide safe, high quality professional oral care. We recognize the unique needs of ADC students it's, it's challenging to study often in a, a different language to your primary language and in a different cultural setting. We, we encourage the integration of graduates of the ADC into the profession and interacting with your colleagues. We are committed to providing tailored support and resources to help ADC students succeed in this new environment. If you are an ADC student, you're eligible for free membership of the Australian Dental Association. There are some limitations by state branches depending on duration and membership, which can be looked into, but ultimately when you're participating in your exams, we're with you to help ease the process and support you. A very important um, project the ADA has developed is called Peer 
P-E-E-R. And um, I don't know, Gus, if you have that uh, slide, if that could be put up at some stage by sharing your screen. Um, peer is essentially a secure uh, networking link for uh, dental, dental students and dentists. And in particular, there's a special community, the peer candidates community, which is just for ADC um, students and graduates and expert members of the ADA who can help you with the questions you might have uh, to navigate your path through the examination process. We consider it a safe community which has boundaries of uh, only certain um, people can join. It's not just like the internet or Facebook where anyone can jump on. It's safe, supportive platform that allows ADA members to undergo the ADC exams to connect with each other, share their experiences and access essential resources as well. And of course, this is a free service that you can uh, gain access to. We encourage all students to um, join and, and share with their colleagues. It's an exclusive community, community and there is exclusive CPD that sits within that community aimed just at you. We have material on infection control, item number utilization, procedures, and clinical advice. Excuse me. It's quite a bit of this, so I had to write it down. You can do this anonymously if you so choose when you write to peer, or you can put your name on it, really. Um, we have moderators who make sure there isn't inappropriate behavior or bullying, so it is a, a safe community to talk to. So don't be anonymous if you don't need to be. We provide complementary therapeutic guidelines, which is a comprehensive uh, document looking at um, up-to-date information on medicine use in Australia. We try and keep this uh, in such a way that you stay informed of important changes within the pharmaceutical uh, industry and products. We support students through examinations and we understand the stress and challenges that students face during examinations. After all, we've been through some. The ADA is committed to providing support and guidance to help students navigate that demanding period in their lives. We offer a range of resources, including study tips, examination preparation strategies, and access to mentors. Mentoring is such a profoundly important part of being a professional. Um, we consider the issues of, of mental health concerns and there are a number of different groups that you can access on this, including us. So we're not exclusive in this, um, but through our peer environment, we hope that you can reach out to people with similar cultural and language backgrounds and find comfort in interacting with your uh, previous countrymen and women. We actively engage with the ADC to explore, explore ways to incorporate the ADA support network into their system, ensuring that ADC students have access to resources and support they need to thrive. Key areas uh, of support include career and CPD, so continuing professional development material. There's extensive material there on just about any topic you can uh, think of. There's career guidance, there's networking and uh, events to help members advance their careers and stay up to date with the latest advancements in dentistry. We very much encourage it to be a cohesive uh, profession uh, where we interact with each other and learn and, and really get the support of others. Our HR service, which is human resources or employment and seeking employment, is a, another big part of the ADA and it's a big cost to us, but it's important to members to have contractual advice, uh, assistance you may need to work in Australia and navigating the complexities of, of employment opportunities within Australia, which may be different to what you're used to. The ADA Jobs Board is a way to find a job. Uh, so that's something that is a, an excellent resource that can be very useful uh, when you've completed your examinations and you're looking for work. Our dedicated team provides personalized assistance to members on a range of issues from practice management to regulatory compliance. 
Our farmer advice service allows you to call our expert pharmacy consultant who uh, is particularly knowledgeable about medicines and prescribing for dental practitioners. And this is a, a unique uh, boutique product which uh, is, is very valuable indeed. And medicines information is available through the ADA's subscription to AUSDI, AUSDI, and included, is included for all our members. So if you're a student, you can get access to that. What does the ADA do and how would it help you? Will we advocate for the interests of the dental profession at all levels of government? ensuring that our, your voices are heard. We keep members informed of the latest news and development within the dental industry through our website, newsletters, and social media channels. We also publish infection control resources, which are quite comprehensive and allow you to stay between the flags and practice safely. We provide information on the utilization of item numbers. I was vice chair of that committee for many years and we write the item numbers and we also give advice on what appropriate use of item numbers is, which might help you not get into trouble with private health insurers. And of course we provide practical advice on materials and equipment um, and things that you should know about which uh, allow you to get the best out of dental materials. We also give you access to the National Digital Library, another project I'm very proud of, and we spend a lot of money having a single sign-on and being able to search five very large databases and get probably somewhere between 95 and 97 percent of the time you can get the PDF of the article you're looking for within a minute or two, not having to subscribe to the journal, not having to trawl through various databases. It's a wonderful resource I use every week. And of course, we provide networking and connection opportunities for members and foster a sense of community among our members, creating a supportive environment for professional growth and camaraderie. All these services are included in the ADA member membership package. In conclusion, the ADA is committed to providing strong support and advocacy for the dental profession and ADC students as they navigate their journey in Australia. We encourage you to join the community, take advantage of the benefits of ADA membership and hopefully remain an ADA member once you see how valuable our resources are. Together, we can foster a thriving dental profession that delivers excellent oral health care for all Australians. Thank you. And you can uh, stop sharing now. Thanks, Gus. That was great. And thank you, Trini. Thank you so much for that, Scott. That's amazing. Um, I think I knew about a couple of those things, but um, I was taking notes. That's, that's um, really good. So providing that secure ne network the peer environment, um, support with um, access to resources, complementary um, PG, complementary um, member, free membership. Um, that's that's great. So I hope Thank everyone you. was taking notes as well because we have all those those resources and many times we don't take advantage of them. So exactly. um, yeah. Yeah, so we are going to see you again in about 15 more minutes, Scott, for the panel discussion. Uh, yes, and we are going to thank you. We are going to move on to the next presentation, the final one. Um, and we're going to have Annie Williams talking about the Dental Practitioner Support Program. How are you, Annie? I'm well, thank you, Trini. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us. So a little bit about Annie. Um, Annie Williams is currently Acting Director of Nursing for Statewide Services, Turning Point, and Manager for Nurse and Midwifery Support and Professional Projects, which include the Dental Practitioner Support Service. Annie has a Master of Science in Pain Management from Sydney University, and is currently undertaking, um, undertaking a Master's of Health Leadership and Management through the University of New South Wales. Annie's areas of interest are clinical governance and service improvement and mentoring emerging clinician leaders. 
in her spare time, you can find any paddle boarding and ocean swimming. So Annie's here to provide an overview of the Dental Practitioner Support Program. Annie? Thank you. Thanks, Trini. And thanks to the ADC for the opportunity to present to you all today. And welcome to all of you who are joining us from overseas. Um, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on with, that we're on today. Um, and I join you from Wurundjeri country, uh, the unceded lands of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to any First Nations people here today. Uh, so first slide, please. Uh, next slide. And the next slide. Thank you. So today I'm going to explain a little bit about dental practitioner support or DPS as it's known. Um, I'll share with you some um, uh, interesting comparisons and outcomes. Um, we can have a look at the website and the social media pages, um, a brief case example, and then what's next um, in place for DPS. Next slide. So DPS launched in July of 2020, and it's a free telephone and online support service for dental uh, professionals, for new graduates and students across Australia. So it provides confidential advice, um, referral options, and some service navigation um, on a wide variety of issues, including mental and physical health, uh, workplace issues, and general wellbeing. The DPS is independent from APRA and the DBA, and it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Next slide. And the goals and aims of the DPS are to increase the availability and accessibility of support for health issues that dental practitioners may um, experience. Places priority on uh, decreasing stigma and encouraging and normalising early intervention for any health concerns. Um, it wants to enhance and contribute to the retention of the workforce and then, as by default, create safer care for the Australian public. Next slide. So this um, slide just indicates a year-to-year -year comparison. So as I said, the service started in 2020 and you can see it sort of grew exponentially 2021-2022 when uh, healthcare professionals were really um, experiencing significant stress related to COVID-19. We then see a drop-off in 22-23, um, and I've been very lucky to be able to work with Mark Ford, and we're currently... Um, undertaking a review uh, for our next um, next steps into, into trying to increase the uptake of dental practitioner support. Next slide. This slide gives you a little bit of an insight into the caller demographics. So October 2022 to September 23. So you'll see predominantly uh, the callers have been dentists. But just keep in mind that this service is anonymous and so some people don't wish to disclose any information. Um, there's small uptake um, in a, from the other dental professions like prosthetists, um, hygienists, therapists, oral health therapists, some occasionally some dental nurses. Um, but of interest to us and a gap that we identified was that there was no um, ADC exam candidates, and this is certainly an area that we'll be focusing on in 2024. Um, predominantly Queensland, um, or the callers were from Queensland, uh, and there's some gaps we've identified in the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory. And because the service is anonymous, there are some people who did not wish to disclose where they were calling from. Of the people who wish to um, answer the identifying questions, the majority were female, um, but 
there's 36 unknown. So these are also gaps in information that we would like to um, work towards clarifying in the future and perhaps looking at the way that we collect our data to make it um, less invasive for the callers. Next slide. By and large, the presenting issues were workplace concerns. So this included um, issues of bullying, uh, job insecurity, um, the regulatory concerns were the next um, most frequent reason for calling. And as Mark's already alluded to, some people, there was concerns whether they should self-report or whether people had been reported. Um, alcohol and drug use um, or concerns relatively minor health issues not related to mental health issues, um, the next reason for calling. Um, mental health issues that were diagnosed and then mental health issues of concern uh, that followed suit. The issue here is that if the, medic if the mental health issue is um, diagnosed and stable, quite often there is no need for the uh, practitioner to report. However, as Mark um, alluded to in his talk, it's always better to just make that phone call and check. Mental health um, issues of concern predominantly related to stress management. Next slide. This slide gives you an indication of what sort of advice and options were presented to the callers. By and large, the callers were um, referred or it was recommended that they contact their GPs. There was some um, recommendations to speak with APRA and run the um, issue of concern by them. The mental health um, issues were dealt with by suggesting GP referral for mental health um, care plans. Um, Again, because the um, service is anonymous, the other quest, the other um, tab there is quite large, which for obviously for data collection is not ideal, but it did encompass things like journaling, um, accessing um, apps for meditation and relaxation, um, some physio um, and OT as well as um, breath work. There was also some suggestions for legal, um, for the individual to contact uh, legal um, support or employee assistance um, programs within the, um, the businesses that they were working for. Next slide. This is an example of the front page of the website. Um, and then some of the actual pages that um, are included once you d dive into the website. So there are sections for students and for recent graduates. There's also um, stories and discussion around mental health, self-care, helping colleagues, looking after yourself. There's also blogs where uh, practitioners are able to actually contribute by writing their own stories or um, answering some questions. So user-generated content, content from current dental practitioners. Next slide. Social media is a very common form of um, interaction and advertising for us. So with Instagram, LinkedIn and Facebook, um, all with the Dental Practitioner Support tab. Next slide. Um, apologies in advance for the very wordy slide, but essentially this, the, um, a newly graduated dentist joined a practice where uh, in the interview um, it was uh, promised that there would be a lot of opportunities to learn new skills and consolidate what they had uh, learned at university. Unfortunately, the owner of the practice um, had themselves a large caseload and so weren't able to meet um, these um, or meet the 
the promises and the expectations of the new um, graduate. So the graduate dentist felt isolated and quite out of their depth um, and actually was considering whether they needed to stay with the practice. So the caller wanted to know what to do. And a lot of the clinicians who take calls from, um, from individuals with similar stories find that basically most people know what they want to do. They just want the opportunity to actually tell their story and debrief. So some options around what was um, had been discussed were um, uh, run through, the, talking to the principal dentist, or even perhaps leaving the job for another um, more supportive practice. In the end, the, the new graduate decided to actually speak to the dental practice owner, but was very happy to have been um, afforded the time and opportunity to um, express their concerns. And the stresses and the pressures of being a new graduate or joining a practice or, or in fact running a practice are well documented um, in peer reviewed publications um, and stories from time to time also appear in mainstream media. So the importance of maintaining confidentiality is acknowledged, but being able to have the time to actually work through these issues with a clinician who has professional expertise um, is very valuable. Next slide. So moving forward, we're very lucky to have um, a collaborative um, and productive relationship with APRA and the board um, and looking forward to improvement um, and quality work uh, this in 2024 obviously an established relationship with the Australian Dental Council um, will ensure, um, I think, better um, uptake by uh, dental practitioners and new graduates and students. And we look forward to the opportunity to, um, to carry out this work. Next slide. So I'd like to, again, thank you all and you can find the email address there, there's the Facebook, LinkedIn and um, Twitter handles, as well as the Instagram page. The number 1800 377 700 um, is a 20, as I said, 24 hour, seven day a week number. And thank you very much. Thank you, Annie, for all that information. Um, it is great to, to know and to hear again that we have all that support as new practitioners or people that have been working for ages but in, a, in such a different environment and many times trying to get used to the, the new country, new language, new surroundings and, and absolutely everything else. So if, if it's already a problem for someone who grew up in here and, um, and they have a lot of support around, imagine for people from overseas that are getting everything uh, kind of upside down. So it's great to hear again that we have that support. And as you said before, sometimes we just need to be validated and reassured. Mm -hmm. Many times we kind of know the answers, but we just need another set of ears to, to let us know that we are not completely crazy. And just um, sometimes presenting the options in a, in a different manner can help us so much. So Thank you again, and we will bring uh, back again uh, Ben, Mark, Scott, and Annie. Please stay with us for uh, the the panel discussion. So, guys, um, due to some time constraints, we are going to be asking just one question. We uh, question to each one of the um, uh, presenters. Um, we have many questions coming through the chat and hopefully we will be able to um, send you the answer or respond to those uh, questions very soon to all the candidates. But we are going to start with Ben and Mark. Um, so we got one just in the chat and um, someone wants to know, as an international graduate, do I need to take an English test if I already hold an Australian passport? 
Thanks, Trini. I can I can help with that one. And thank you, Mark, for your presentation earlier. Um, look, I noticed in the questions there were a number of questions related to the English language um, part of the presentation that Mark talked about. And so before answering that question, I would just like to recommend if anyone's got questions about that, and clearly there are some, to go and read the English language standard and the associated documents, because there is a whole lot of really useful information there that addresses directly a lot of the questions which have appeared in the Q&A chat there. Um, in relation to that particular question about holding a passport, the English language um, requirement is based on education path, not what passport you hold. So that's very, very clear when you go and have a look at the standard. So um, just because you hold an Australian passport doesn't mean that you don't need to satisfy the board's English language requirements. So go and have a look at the standard, see which pathway you're on, and that's how you'll determine whether you meet it. I'm going to be a bit cheeky, Trini, so I hope you'll excuse me just to weave in an extra answer to the question, because also in the Q&A, there was a question about a time limit between completing the ADC exams and the registration process with ARC from the board. And this is sometimes we often see when people delay meeting the English language requirement and take more than a year, because we have, the board also has a recency of practice registration standard. And in order to meet that, a graduate from the ADC process has to register within 12 months of completing it. And the most common reason for candidates not doing that or applicants not doing that is because they haven't met the English language standard. So the two are always slightly linked from, from our end. Um, so if you don't meet the standard, try and meet it within the first 12 months after completing the ADC. And I hope that helps whoever asked those questions. Thanks, Trini. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, now we are going to move on to the next question. So we had a couple for Scott. Um, I believe the first one has been um, already answered during the presentation. People wanted to know what does the ADA offer for uh, to support ADC candidates uh, or students dur during the process. He gave so many um, in detail information about that. So we're going to go to the next one and it is how can the ADA help with the mental health challenges that some ADC students could face? Emmy, um, give me one second. We wanted to know what is the best way for candidates to access uh, the services? Um, so the 1800 number is always available. Um, and then I think on the, I'm sure you're going to share the slides with the candidates. Is that correct? The, the email, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and Twitter handles are also there as well. Um, but I would call or email, um, particularly if you are um, perhaps email, if you are uh, contacting from overseas. Thank you so much for that, Annie. So let's see if we can get Scott back. Scott, are you there? I'm not sure. I'm um, here. It, it's been a bit patchy. I'm in a hotel room in a, a branch practice. Can you hear me? We can hear you well now. So uh, would you like me to repeat okay, the I'll question, Scott? Yes, please. So the candidates want to know how can the ADA help with the mental health challenges that some ADC students could face? I think that... The, Probably the strongest way to help is having mentors for this interact with their peers, uh, others already.
the only problems are you that unfortunately we're not able to hear scott's answer very well um is it I, th I think he wanted to say that the mentoring uh part of the uh, the peer space uh was a big support let me see if i have you again i'll, I'll try again I'm, I'm not in my usual computer i'm in a hotel room let's um, try once this... again So it, it's the interviews with people. So have a them. Unfortunately, guys, we are so having problems with Scott's connection. I do apologize about that. Period. I'm sure many of you wanted to hear his answer. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Um, oh. It seems to throw. I'm not sure. Okay. So I apologize again, guys. Maybe we are going to have to um, just leave that one up in the air for today. Um, if Scott can send us his um, answer, maybe we can um, just put it again, send it to all the candidates with all the other information, and I'm pretty sure everyone will appreciate that. Um, thank you again to all the participants for your time, for your effort, for all that information that you gave us today. Um, as I said before, these are um, questions that the candidates um, suggested or requested. Uh, so I'm pretty sure everyone was taking notes and I'm happy that we have this opportunity, this um, forum to be able to hand that information in such a beautiful way. Um, again, people from all over the world in morning, afternoon, evening, thank you for joining us and for um, giving us your time as well. Uh, my name is Trinidad Casiali, uh, representing the ADC and representing the students as well as a successful candidate not long ago. Thank you very much for joining us and have a lovely evening.